<laughs> I think we're live now. Yeah, you're good. Okay. <laughs> good evening. <laughs> it's Louise Esteran. Chkwabanaki ig, Eskumogari nil, Nurebeg Ziba ig, Wigul Bonwapskewi. My name's Esther Ann. I am Wabanaki, people of the place where the sun first looks our way, and I am Passamaquoddy. Uh, my family's from Zibayag, and I live here with Penobscot people. Um, and I'm very happy to be here tonight. I just had a fun time visiting with Sandy and Drew and Penn, which is always lovely. Um, <clears throat> we're here today to have a discussion about the with Sandy and Drew about the wonderful documentary, Blood Memory. And it's in celebration of the fifth year of the release of the report of the historic Maine Wabanaki State Child Welfare Truth and Reconciliation Commission, of which Sandy was a commissioner. So it's it's like been a whole month of celebration and homecoming and a lot of reminiscing and I'm having a good time. So I wanna hand it over to my colleague, Kenthea. Uh, good evening, everyone. Wonderful to be here. Thank you, Esther. Um, I uh, am Penthea Burns, uh, speaking to you live from Lewiston, Maine, and uh, uh, really proud to have been part of this process with uh, the Esther was referring to Sandy, and uh, and really happy to have Drew here with us. I am um, and the on the board for Maine Wabanaki Reach, which we'll talk a bit about tonight as our discussion goes on. Um, and our goal is to really talk a lot about some of the lessons that um, Sandy and Drew bring forward in the film, um, and what that might. Uh, what lessons that might hold for us here as we're thinking about truth, healing, and change uh, in this territory. Uh, so I'm going to start with having um, Sandy just do a brief introduction of herself, and then Drew is going to introduce himself and tell us a little bit about this very cool form, uh, format that we're on here. So uh, Sandy, say hello to everybody. Yes, I'm Atakia P. Chanteo Shteo Nape Chiyuzu P. Sichangu Lakota He Mataha. Um, good afternoon, relatives. Um, I want to say a special greeting to any of uh, our listeners who may have been separated from their Indian family or their tribe uh, uh, through either adoption or foster care. And a special uh, greeting as well to our mothers and fathers who gave us life. Um, I said that I am from the Rosebud uh, Reservation in South Dakota, and I live here in Shakopee currently, and just excited to have a discussion with you to hear your thoughts and reflections uh, from the film Blood Memory. Thanks so much, Sandy. Um, Drew, um, how would you like to introduce yourself and then tell us a little bit about this format here? Yeah, sure. Well, I'll start real quickly just by outlining how everything works. So if, if uh, as you tune in, if you look at the bottom down here, um, you'll see some tabs, a call to action tab, a ask a question, polls, um, and then see a list of everybody here as well as the chat window. Um, if you have a question you'd like to pose to the panel, if you just click the ask a question tab, you can uh, post a question in there. If you like a question that somebody else asked, you can vote it up. Um, and then we have some polls that we put in just to get a sense of who's in the room and who our audience is and how you heard about this, just to sort of help guide the discussion. Um, so if you wanna, while we're doing these intros, just sort of um, chime in on those polls to get started. If you have any questions you'd like to pose as a poll, feel free to throw it in the chat and we can add that as well. Also, this whole thing's being recorded and uh, I'll send out a uh, to everybody who participated and registered a video afterward uh, outlining some of the really cool teaching functions because as we answer these questions that you'll pose, it'll record each answer to the question and you can export that as its own individual clip or just go back and just watch that answer when you do the rewatch of the event. Um, so it's a, a lot of really cool uh, you know, technology going on that makes it a little more accessible. Um, so I'll just quickly tell how the, how I came to the film and how I met Sandy and how this kind of got started. Uh, so back in 2010, I just gotten out of film school 
and uh, was sitting in a coffee shop with some uh, some of my peers discussing what we were going to do now that we were out of film school. And uh, this woman had overheard us in the coffee shop and said, oh, I have a story for you. You know, and as a filmmaker, that's sort of a statement you dread hearing because you don't know <laughs> what's going to come next, you know. Um, but we started talking and she had a TV show idea that I couldn't really help her uh, help her with. But I asked her because um, she had mentioned that she was Native American. And this was in in Pittsburgh, um, where I was living at the time. And I had never in my life in Pennsylvania met somebody who introduced themselves to me as being uh, indigenous. And I just was like, you know, oh, that's th that realization clicked in that moment. And so we started talking and I just asked her what brought her to Pittsburgh. And she said adoption. And she grew up in Pittsburgh, adopted from Minnesota. And um, and I was like, oh, that's nice. And she's like, no, it's not really this life saving thing that you think it is. Um, it is actually this really like negative systematic uh, uh policy and she told me about that and then we started talking about the boarding school era and the first uh federally funded uh boarding school being carlisle uh in, which is a town in central pennsylvania a town that i had spent a lot of time in growing up um and so in that conversation all these things just kind of started swirling through my head of how sort of ignorant i was to this history that was so immediately around me and in in my state and i i love history you know and um and so it just sort of became this obsession and she had mentioned sandy in that conversation and i after i'd done a little bit of research i reached out to sandy and said hey this woman mentioned you um i'm really compelled by what you're doing i just want to learn more how can i learn more um and will you talk to me and Sandy naturally is like, oh, I don't know, white boy from the East. Like, you know, if you if you want to <laughs> learn something, you might, you know, you, you just have to come out here to Minnesota. I have a powwow next month. You should come out. And so I, I went out in 2010, uh, met Sandy and a, a bunch of uh, amazing folks uh, in in the uh, community there who are working around all of this, um, you know, uh, family reunification and uh, strengthening of community healing work and it's just been really cool over those 10 years now of making the film and doing the research and getting it out there to see how those people who I met at the beginning who were, it was a lot of people it was there they were in the circle the first time I was in the circle you know just listening and now they're leaders in the community in Minneapolis and around the country and it's been really cool to see that evolution and sort of be able to witness that and witness the strength that's come out of it so um that's kind of how it started and yeah now we're here so i'll stop talking <laughs> thank you so much drew sandy I, um <laughs> i keep thinking about the first few seconds of the film um and how um I mean, I know you, I've known you only as an adult uh, in the last few years. So I wonder what you want to say about um, how that film started and, and what what that means to you or I don't know, like that just is so such a powerful start. Sure. I um, It's also that recall of that, that recall that began my healing process to to return to Rosebud and to look for my relatives. So also that I had never spoken, I'd never said that recall until I was 35. I would have a blip, like literally like a two or three second blip in my brain and even maybe a little sensation in my body of Ugh, but I had no idea what this was. And then finally um, I'm in a uh, recovery group for uh, women who uh, who had endured mother-daughter incest. And in this uh, process of, uh, of uh, recovery, I just, I can't even remember how it was that that memory came out. Oh yeah, I do, but it takes too long to tell. But uh, I re just remember I, we'd been given this assignment. I do the assignment, come back to this group and that that recall of 
this being the be the sensation of being lifted and put in the truck all the detail that i remember about the bib overhauls that my adoptive dad is wearing the my my adoptive mom's skin and the smell um was so different and i remember as i'm remembering this i'm thinking that is weird you are so freaking weird why would you even that's i really downplayed myself I had all this self-doubt as I was recalling this for the first time at 35. And um, so I'm, I'm recalling this and then, but what, what was, what's really important about this that I, the reason I would like to share it is to speak to the importance of that recall is actually me standing in back of the truck, in the truck bed, looking through that back window at a little brown girl going through that which means at age 18 months old, I left my body. I left my body because of the terror. And so um, lots, a lot of social work, you know, hinges around the younger they are, the easier it'll be for them to adjust and everything else. And I never did adjust. It was horrible, you know, and then right after that, you know, there's recalls of abuse that started in between her and I. So um, I'm glad Drew caught that. He got the red pickup. He got, <laughs> he got all of that. It was pretty amazing. And um, a woman who was willing to have her arm in the, <laughs> in, the, in the film and everything. But when I was embarrassed about the circles in her arm, I had two counselors in that group. They were um, Puerto Rican women. So they picked up on all the differences that she said, you know, the skin does feel different. What you saw are pores in her arm, mm. you know, and I'm like, oh, my God. And it just, you know, it validated everything that I was experiencing since with my senses and, you know, everything. So because uh, this felt pretty weird. What do I remember? I Circles on this lady's arm. But at 18 months old, that's all I know. Right. That's all I could say. So anyway, I was just blown away. I thought it was pretty cool how Drew did that. But can I just share something funny too? Yeah. <laughs> Is, you know, my walking, you know, it opens with me walking and talking and telling that memory. So we had just filmed, Drew had just filmed the welcome home that you see at the end. Mm. You know, he'd already been up and, um, and I, and I've really gotten close to Drew by then. I always call him my adopted white son now. And, and uh, just raise hell with him. But uh, he always has this vision of uh, how he wants something to look. I mean, he's always thought things through everything. So Sandy, he says, I want you to meet me on the on the road. We're on, on the res yet, uh, getting ready to go home. And he goes, I want, so I want you to walk down the road. I'm like, walk down this gravel road? Are you kidding? Nobody walks down the gravel road. Just walking along like, ah, oh, I'm on my res, just walking. And I was like, no way. And um, he's like, no, it'll look good. And my daughter's with me. George is trying to calm me down. I'm going, no effing way. I'm not going to walk. I got to look stupid. I can't make it look natural. <laughs> so I just went back and forth. <laughs> Poor Drew, he's always trying to talk me into shit. And I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> So anyway, it gets done and he sends it to Denise, who's in the film. You know, she's the one who talks about the boarding school, the cost. It's cheaper, you know, mm. <laughs> he sends it to Denise and Denise goes, Sandy, that opening is so powerful. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Drew was right. <laughs> he was always right. <laughs> and he would just hang in there and go, oh, God, here she goes. You know, you just gotta wait for the it'll she'll she'll come around. <laughs> yeah, stay in a different a way. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was it was good. <laughs> Sandy, when when you were talking, um, I was thinking about so back in when we first got together, me and Wabanaki Reach, our roots started in 1999 when the tribes and the state got together to create a training for uh, caseworkers to help them follow ICWA. And one of the things we did was create a video <clears throat> and we interviewed Wabanaki people to sh and had them share their experiences about being in care prior to ICWA. And one of them said, 
um, they articulated what, you know, we saw this theme going through their stories and they said that the trauma was in the taking that, you know, it did make a little difference in how they were taken, but even if they were taken in the most textbook, best practice, social work way, it was still traumatic for them because mm -hmm. they were taken from their community. Mm -hmm. and, you know, saw and we also heard their stories and also the experiences they had while in care, um, whether they were real horrendous or, you know, really good. They still had this um, this this sense of trauma or this uh, loss or what we know as you know intergenerational trauma. Yeah, the, I I saw that film when we were when we came out there in two thousand and seven, and I remember just thinking, um, just you know, my heart going out to other adoptees, and knowing exactly what that feels like. There's no language to describe what you're going through. Um, and it, it's trauma, it's loss, it's a deep grief ongoing. Uh, and then if you have an unhealthy situation, then it's just complex trauma, one thing after another. And um, yeah, so it's it's horrendous. And it is the taking that that time of in in, in our in the TRC report, and you guys even have it. The edit Adam, I really liked how he put that in there. I was taken when I was three. I was taken, and that's the language that they used, because that is, you know, is what it is. So, good, good question there, Penn. That was. I'm glad that you that that spoke to you, because Drew worked really hard to make that all happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, it makes me think about. I mean, the work that you're doing now, First Nations Repatriation Institute, that you are connecting. How you connected with that child in you? to unpack your own story and now you are doing the same with uh, with people across this land um, and I wonder if you just want to share some about that work and what you're learning from that what you want people to know oh sure uh, so in 2007 the White Earth Tribe the Jerry Jaskin uh, and a White Earth Tribal um, member at the time was the director of the Indian Child Welfare Unit for the tribe. And she asked me if I would work with the tribe to um, develop a welcome home, do a welcome home for their adoptees, for their relatives. And, and so I started um, doing that. Um, it was remarkable. But my goal was that when we first, when this first when we did our first welcoming prior to 2007, we did a lot of work between 2000 and 2007 with communities. And my, my hope was that my vision that I saw was each tribe having a call out for their relatives to um, return, for their birth relatives to be acknowledged and to have that part of that healing happen during annual annual gatherings because that's when everyone comes home. Um, so I was just thrilled then when the White Earth Tribe wanted to do this. So we started working with them and we've been working, I've been working with them ever since every year. And um, what my goal was that they would, since they're an Ojibwe tribe, that they would hear and learn Ojibwe, hear Ojibwe songs, hear the Ojibwe language, understand what does it mean to be uh, come from White Earth? What does that mean? Where the White Earth people originate from? What are their creation stories? So every adoptee, while they can connect to any Indian community, because there's a part of us that's um, that we share common values, but then there's a time when we need to hear our language our songs and understand where we come from. So um, then, uh, so doing that every year and then one year, it's a longer story, but it was really cool how I eventually it ended up that you witnessed in the film the first year we did the welcome home for our relatives in, um, in Rosebud. And it's so important for our 
relatives who've been separated to be able to share what happened to them, what was on their mind, what they thought of. Most of the time they've never shared anything. And you even saw that in Donland. And when we saw that um, just in the communities, you're the first person I've ever told. I've never told anyone this because you feel ashamed. It's like you, for some reason, adoption gives you this false narrative that you should be happy where you are. You should feel just fine where you are because we put you in a place that's better than where you were. And uh, you spend your whole life trying to normalize that. And there's no way to normalize that because it isn't normal. But um, so the importance is to make connections with other adoptees, um, spiritual leaders in the community. And um, each person's healing path is a little different and uh, individual and but it's beautiful and amazing to watch people come back who are so afraid to even look up sometimes. And then a year later, just see them blossom into who they were meant to be. It's really, really incredible. Thanks, Sandy. I was finding my unmute button. <laughs> <laughs> Esther, did you, Esther, I noticed you unmuted. I didn't know if you wanted to say something. So, Drew, um, I'm going to skip over to you for a second, give Sandy a, a moment to rest. Um, <clears throat> and um, I'm curious about what it was like for you making this film and the experiences you had as a, as a white man, like what you had to grapple with or learn as a white man to do this film and to do justice to what, um, uh, it, like is just so, it's outside our experience in a way, except we were the ones who who did many of these things. So, um, so really holding that as well as holding your role as a filmmaker. Yeah, yeah, I think, so in 10 years, there's been a lot of lessons learned for sure. Um, mm -hmm. The first three were really just research, you know, Indian country 101, you know, like getting the history down as much as I could, learning as much as I could, reading anything that anybody told me to read. And, um, you know, so each sort of like phase of the film and phase of the process was a very, very um different personal challenge um but i will say that the biggest the, the i think the biggest sort of uh realization was just sort of letting go of the preconceived ideas of what you're supposed to do as a filmmaker um you know you're taught that you have to keep distance from your subjects you know uh, as a documentarian like you don't want to get too personal you want to um, you know, be non-biased, you know, and, and soon I learned that it wasn't going to work that way. You know, it just wasn't going to work that way. You know, you have to, you know, just, you, ha you have to become part of the community. You know, Sandy would say, Hey, you guys are going to stay on our couch. No more sleeping on strangers couches. And I was like, uh, well, that ethically, I don't know. Uh, you know, and it was just like, but those things, uh, added up and allowed for an intimacy in other moments like when sandy's going through her photos and you know taking us through those moments we have an abbreviated language that's happening there um because a lot of those stories she had told us over and over and over again and each one takes an hour to tell but um in that moment she knew we had heard the stories so many times and so she was like well you remember that person so I don't have to, you know and like so you get that shorthand um and then another really good example of just how, you know, being present in the community, um, you know, learning to show up with with groceries and, um, you know, and, and gifts, whether, you know, whatever it may be, and just being respectful. I think all those things have helped. I mean, I was 21 now, you know, 30, now I'm 32. And I think a lot of the lessons I learned really helped sort of form the person that I was growing into, you know, and I've personally felt like a huge uh uh, graduation through the process, you know, and, um, I learned a lot about manhood and community, you know, uh, through, through that, that I'm definitely going to take forward. Um, but, uh, I think a really good moment in the film 
because of the time that it took, the third year that we went back to Rosebud was the year that we filmed the boarding school camp scene uh, where <laughs> Leonard and the <laughs> other gentleman, George and Kenny, are all talking about boarding school and just joking around about it. And that conversation took three years to, you know, develop. You know, I, I talked with Leonard about everything but the stuff we wanted to talk with him about, you know, to get to that moment. You know, we talked about cars. We talked about hunting. We hung out and just did, you know, and did it on his time, you know, because when I first went out to Rosebud, it was five years in the making. It was I was like super impatient. I was like, oh, my God, I've been waiting five years to get out here and do this filming. Film everything, you know, and, <laughs> and it just really kind of killed some moments. It killed a lot of moments. And um, mm. but we were able and but that was good. And so at first, the time that it took was really something that I was sort of ashamed of. Oh, this is taking way too long, you know. This isn't like none of this is going to make sense anymore when we're you know just you get these ideas in your head and and if anything it became more relevant and more accurate and more and it just became better the more time um, and now I'm like you know still digging in for the next however many years it's going to take to keep doing the work around the film that I now realize somebody has to do you know so yeah <laughs> so right thank, right on thank you for that Drew mm -hmm. I um uh, it when you said film everything so what are you doing with all of this footage that you have <laughs> have you thought about that yeah yes. yeah so yep. yeah we have and um and it um so a couple of i i'll real quickly just want to step back to one more thing i just thought of that that idea triggered um as the white male coming into the story my, and coming from that perspective of you know i don't know this history i need to learn more about this history other white people need to know this history too. And I was coming at it from that idea of like, we need to take this story and get it out to the masses, so to say. But yes, that's a part of it. But then as you're, as we were going through it, it was like, Oh, but that's just more of the same. That's just more of the same profiteering and whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, manipulation, you know, it shouldn't be about, changing white people's minds and educating them. It should be about, you know, everyone sharing their story and being uplifted by sharing their story through this process. And so like that started to be, that started to shift. Whereas our intention shifted very, very consciously to no, this, this is about strengthening the community that was affected by this, you know, m specifically the, the people who had gone through removal, but then, you know, the community at large. But then with your uh, question, um, yeah, there's a boatload of footage. I think we have over 600 hours of footage. Um, mm -hmm. we, were, we were just filming because mm -hmm. Rosebud wasn't doing the welcome home ceremony until 2015. So that was five years into our development. Um, and so we were filming a lot of different stuff. The baby Veronica case happened in 2013. And then that really sort of created a whole new page to the film that wasn't going to be there, a whole mm -hmm. new side. Mm -hmm. And so we started filming all the BIA hearings and all this stuff that's really going to be, you know, if you look at the historical con uh, footage we have in the film now, hopefully one day that material will be used in the same way for a future documentary, I hope. Um, exactly. Uh, so we're trying to find a home for all this material and we're working on building educational curriculum around it. And basically what we want to do is make a, a digital archive where all the footage it, we have transcripts. We have all the footage available. We just need to upload it and house it somewhere. And the idea would be that through this database um, and our, edu our, like basically our educational packets will hyperlink to the video. So you can go and you can watch the fully transcribed interview with Bert Hirsch or Senator Aberes mm -hmm. or the, uh, the adoptees that we interviewed from beginning to end, how, you know, um, and have that fully transcribed um interview and hyperlink it right into your pdf file would be the goal wow. um, so we're talking with a couple universities um i right now it looks like university of minnesota is interested through their school social work and um so we're just figuring out how the logistics of that would work fantastic you know, it's interesting to me how the timing was just perfect because sandy 
was busy with the Truth Commission until 2015. It, of June, and then right after that, you had the ceremony in Rosebud 2015. <laughs> it's like it was meant to be, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and Drew was concerned about that parallel thing going on with, with Dawnland, you know, because yeah. he had started 2010 and had this story that had not been told. Then Dawnland comes out with, you know, all the resources and everything to get it done in this record time. And here's plugging along Drew with like five years though. <laughs> with zero yeah. budget. You know, <clears throat> Drew didn't have a budget. I want to say that again. Drew did Drew did not have a budget. So this was truly a work from the heart. And someday he's gonna have a budget, you know, because now he's got this experience. But mm. it was all supposed to be the way it came about. I mean, um, it just it just is, and the, and the two films really complement each other in so terms much. Of, you know, one at following the other. But I want to also talk again, bring us back to Drew talking about how he made relationships because <clears throat> it's true. My brother never speaks about um, boarding school. Um, maybe more so here and there the last ten years, but never never in the way that you saw in the film. And that would not have happened had Drew, I think you were sitting next to him on the picnic table, right, Drew, when that started yeah. happening? So I'm over in the picnic, I'm over where you guys see me in the film, and all of a sudden I hear Leonard talking about boarding school, and I look over at Drew, and I'm like, are you filming that? You know, emotionally, he goes, <laughs> yes. Filming everything. <laughs> I was, <laughs> And I forgot all the, yeah, and I forget all the film guys are there because he brought, like, would you bring four, mm. pe four or five people? Yeah, along? always had, yeah, two to four. A, a crew, you know, and, um, yeah, it was it was so amazing to me that I got up, went, my sister-in-law had just had a stroke, so she was sitting in the truck with my niece, I think, at the time. I think my niece was there at the time. And I said, oh, my God, Leonard's talking about boarding school. <laughs> Come over there. <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, and it was interesting, too. So the uncle that you see in the film that I meet for the first time, when he saw the film for the first time in that boarding school scene, he's watching it when my brother is describing, um, if you do something wrong, they make you line up in the hallway. My, bro my uncle immediately leans over to me and says, hotline, you know, and knew that it was the hotline. So so that generation of my you know the that older generation in us it's the exact same thing you know and my brother's just 67 68 years old and experienced that so i before i forget i made myself a little note uh, i'm gonna have fun telling all these stories about how i made drew's life hell in making the movie so um you're <laughs> making the film <laughs> so Literally, I just love love these kids. I mean, they're just good kids. So because I care for them, I just treat them like I would any other person I care for in my life, which I guess I'm sort of mean. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> old school. Anyway, um, he goes, Sandy, I want you to go through pictures, you know, and I'll film you going through pictures. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's so stupid. No way. I'm not going to do that. Oh, I just, it felt so, I don't know, like, yeah, and here's a picture of me here. And here's it. Uh, I just felt, what is it, unnatural or something? I just, <laughs> I said, no. Yeah. <laughs> I contrived, that's it. I'm not going to do that. Are you kidding me? So Drew, in his persistent, gently persistent way, eventually I say to him, okay, if you can find the pictures, I'll go through them. They're in a room downstairs, they're in the garage, and there's some in my office. And I thought, they are never going to find those pictures in the garage. No way in hell. <laughs> Three car garage of bins and boxes. <laughs> How well stuff. Was that, was that a way to get your garage cleaned out? <laughs> <laughs> And they come back with these bins, and I'm like, oh, shit, they got them. <laughs> so I had to go through them, and it didn't occur to me to comb my hair or, or anything. I just pulled it back. All right, fine. here's this picture. Then it turned out to be kind of cool. <laughs> he's he's on to something. Say, I will say, too, that um, the, all the VHS footage that's in there, uh, 
Sandy's husband, George Macaulay film throughout the years be, um, yeah. a, that's a hobby of his and something he does, um, in his life, but also because Chris Leith told him that he needed to document what was happening. Mm. Mm. And, yeah. um, wow. I remember one day when George pulled out all those tapes and he had a big box and I was like, yeah, let's go through these. <laughs> and so we just like put in random VHS tapes and just spent like a whole day just looking through all of his old tapes. And so a lot of that stuff that's in the film was just like, oh, I remember that's on that tape. Like when Sandy's there and she's like, hi, we're at my brother's house and this is Leonard and that's my sister, Deb. Like, yeah, yeah. It was like there was a documentary being made, you know, well before I was involved, you know? Wow. And, and so it, it was really cool. Um, you know, to be able to just like incorporate that. And I also love the fact that like, surprisingly, some of the shots line up, like the way some of the stuff lined up in it throughout the film, it just had its own thing that it was doing, you know, and it was just- Yeah, cool. that when I'm standing there in Alaska, it I looked for that then. When it says <laughs> foster care and adoption, it looks like I'm saying it for real in the film, but really it's the narrative over it. It's so crazy. <laughs> and that is not how we, little, yeah. Yeah. If you look at anything long enough, you see patterns, right? <laughs> you, and I forgot that George had that, had um, also filmed Alaska really. And I'd forgotten that. So he told me not to say anything about him. He always said that. He's <laughs> so on that. To. <laughs> so I have to. But, you know, no, Drew is right. He had all this. Um, Chris Leith said that it was so important to document. So he had, yeah, he, what, how many hours did he have? I don't know. I have it all in a file somewhere. It was lot. so funny because they're kind of geekoids on the film thing. So they would like get together for hours in the office, come up for air now and then and go back in and look at all that. But you got, you got beautiful stuff out of all that. So way mm. to go, George. Yeah, and we said your name. Yeah, George. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to ask about, um, this is like changing the subject a, a bit. I want to ask about Mark Fiddler and about um, the role that uh, he plays in relation to ICWA. And um, I don't know if you're ready to make that shift um, to that. Um, and uh, it relates to one of the questions that someone has asked already. We've got a bunch of questions piling up here. Yeah, so I want to I want to sort of set the context a little bit. So I want to talk some about him, the role he's playing with ICWA. We probably have a lot more to say about ICWA, the Indian Child Welfare Act, as we go on. But it also relates a question that someone asked about how interesting it was that people really just got to be able to share their truth in this story as opposed to really juxtaposing good and bad. Um, and that people are just presented as they are in the film. So I wonder if you two could spend some time talking about Mark and, um, and how that question relates to the way that you decided to portray him as, as in addition to how he portrays himself. Um, so well, I'll go first and just say, this was another area where we fought Drew. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he got so beat up through this whole thing. <laughs> But he, I did not want Mark Fiddler in the film. George didn't want Mark Fiddler in the film. Every national uh, ICWA person, professional that we knew did not want him in the film. We didn't want any attention drawn to him whatsoever because we felt that, you know, you don't, you just don't want to give him any airtime, right? Because of his view. And I just really uh, respect and appreciate Drew stuck to his guns on how he wanted to just show who he was. And when the film was done, it, when it was first, the first cut, I didn't think did that. And um, I want to add too, I was really proud of him and Megan that night because they, they, they did a screening at Nikwa in 2016, I think. Yeah. And I told them before they went there, to do the screening because I had to go do the adoptee talking circle at that time. And I said, whatever anybody says to you, do not be defensive. Just say thank you. Because <sighs> I knew they were going to get attacked. <laughs> and I mm. thought, but this is going to be good for them to hear the perspective of what people are seeing and how they're reacting. And uh, and they did, to their credit, they just said thank you and took those to learn from them and, and move on. So I was always so proud of everything we asked of him. He did. But um, so in the final cut, 
when you see Mark, it's he comes up being um, as one of our one of my friends who's a nationally known uh, uh, advocate for Nikwa Ikwa said, you know, he's really a tragic figure. Mm -hmm. And um, almost everyone comes away with being angry at him and feeling sorry for him all at once. Yeah. But the part that's so maddening is how he is viewed as a, like, just like it showed in the film where that guy was, he's the guru of Iqua, <laughs> you know? And um, it also speaks to Drew's, uh, it's really to his credit, that Mark trusted him to just get into his inner circle and present his work and you know how he does it. And it's just like Chris used to always say to me, he says, people will always tell on themselves, always just let them do it. And he did, he, he tells on himself in the film, which everyone needs to hear and see, you know? So, and then, and then I met, I met his, uh, cousin when we screened the film and was in Washington and you know she's sad about that part of him as well you know that's mm. her cousin she loves him you know that's her relative but yeah she doesn't agree with that mm. viewpoint at all so um but yeah we didn't want him and I'm now I'm really glad that he's that he was in there you I also want to just that you got this really um intensely a powerful, disturbing moment too, where he's talking with two people who looked mm. like white people to me, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, the the woman says, "Oh, so you're talking from a place of knowing? Oh, you know, like, and uh, so she could surrender to his perspective in the way that um, you know is really tempting for us as white people to do." And the man pivots quickly to, "Hey, did you see the art on the courtroom wall? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. not anything about our history. It was like, it was." That was one of the most disturbing moments in the whole film. That was mm. so powerful. So kudos for getting that. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah. Because just because um, she said, you said that you belong to the tribe or something. You have. So does that mean you have Native American heritage? So they still didn't even understand that he was an enrolled yeah. member of a tribe, even though he, they just listened to him teach. And then he says, yes, I'm 25%. Yeah. You know, and no uh, we, Indians gasp and laugh and slam their fists on a table all at once when they hear that on yeah. how sad and tragic that is. And then, then she goes, well, then, you know, because you're, you're speaking from, you know, experience and whatnot. Well, that was a job, Drew, to get that. I can't believe he got that. I was like, holy crap. <laughs> yeah. 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 So Drew. That you, scene a lot. Yeah. yeah, you did. Yeah. I mean, because we. The whole Mark thing was an exploration from beginning to end. Like we didn't have a set intention going in on that, and which is why I think he he saw that and he trusted us, you know, because we 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 felt it was really backtrack. OK, Sandy's organization put together a panel after Veronica happened. And that panel is in the film with Chrissy and uh, Terry Cross and all these, you know, prominent national uh, child welfare experts. And Mark was on there. And that's when I first heard Mark speak and really understood his mm -hmm. role in the Veronica case. And I was like, wow, what a compelling niche he's in. Like, how how do you rationalize all this going on here? And and I was like, okay, but he's very smart. And I do think in a way he understands ICWA more than anybody I talk to. Um, not necessarily in an emotional way, but in an on the paper, knowing the law inside and out kind of way. You know, yeah. And it's different, you know, and I was like, I don't know, you know, and there's actually a, when, when you first meet Chris, the first thing he says is uh, pray from your heart. Don't pray from what's up here. And that to me is where the whole tone of the film really shifts and where the theme of the film really starts to take over is now we're in this battle of the head versus the heart, you know, mm -hmm. in the rest of the film. And it's just, it's not like that's this prominent thing, but for me, that's really what these two characters became about. Like Mark's really grappling with all this on this very mental, 
you know, psychological level, because that's his whole life is about measuring his whole life is about arguing the argument, you know, winning the point, you know, and like, I can't fault him for that. That's the world in which he's, he's been, he's lived and he's made his way, you know? Um, and Sandy has a very different reaction to her experience, um, being much more guided from the heart, you know? And, um, and I think I saw Mark struggling with his heart in the mm -hmm. filming, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and I think too, a lot of this stuff just came out and he didn't even know. I don't even think he knew some of this stuff uh, sort of resonated the way it did until he saw it with an audience. Cause he watched the film and gave feedback um, and approved him, you know, and signed, you know, signed the contract and approved, you know, we didn't do releases until the film was 90% edited with Sandy and Mark. Wow. It was, it was a, we're doing this on faith, you know, um, and and so uh yeah it was just a really interesting sort of uh tenuous process but i felt it was important to have him in there just from that sort of journalistic thing in the back of my head going like we have to have we have to be even here we have to give everyone a chance to speak you know yes i i might not agree with it the people here might not agree with it but we need to at least say hey do you want to be interviewed for this film do you want to partake in this film Mm -hmm. um and so and as it evolved it, it was just got really interesting yeah so there was never an opportunity where you and mark were together sandy no not in the filmmaking but he and i were on a panel for at a screening at metro state here in st paul there there was one time where you were together when we were filming it and it didn't make oh, the was cut. it during the BIA well, hearings in 2015, oh yeah, um, or 16, when they were redoing ICWA, re, you know, doing the regs, yeah. um, and that was going to be part of the film, the whole part of Mark's sort of narrative. And we were like, "All right, finally, this scene, because Sandy and Mark were both in the same room at the at the um, mm -hmm. doing the the hearing testimony for the BIA, and it was just like going back and forth, and we shot it. We were like, "Okay, this is going to be the moment where our two characters." clash you know and it just never made sense in the narrative uh and we were like okay we'll leave it separate you know um you have got so much footage yeah, yeah. <laughs> some really yeah. been there's a some good theory. teaching it tools totally yeah. Been a yeah 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 well, it can still can it <laughs> yeah yeah right, there's some maybe, teaching yeah. tools yeah <laughs> some great stuff the fact that he got the bia hearings is what really excited me because that that somebody will be looking at in research just like how you research the archival footage of the hearings you know and got mm -hmm. that that's how because those the i was at two of the hearings and uh adoptees came and spoke um lawyers on both sides spoke i mean it was pretty intense and everybody got i think was it a 10 or 15 minute slot to mm -hmm. um share and it it was, it was those hearings were amazing they were amazing so yeah i, I want to share something before i forget before the questions come from everybody yeah just how life unfolds when we think nothing else is gonna how is how are we gonna how is anything gonna make sense and work out for us and i was thinking about how and we i wouldn't have found this out had it not been for drew's research as well but um it, thinking about what was all going on in the 50s and 60s into the 70s was just that systematic removal. There were literally villages that had no children in them because of these kinds of removals. Mm -hmm. And um, Senator Aberisk, who's in the film, who's the head of the Senate Affairs Committee, Indian Affairs Committee, um, he grew up on the reservation. He grew up in Rosebud. Mm -hmm. His family immigrated from Lebanon to, or Syria. Which one? Which one, Drew? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm yeah. Not sure. Anyway, I teased him when I got to now that I got after I got to know him a bit. I said, "Man, you went from poverty to poverty. <laughs> you're immigrating. You're supposed to. <laughs> you went to the res." <laughs> but he grew up there, so the part huh. that I when I saw the hearings then and heard him, heard his voice, and how in the '70s there were still signs in Rapid City and other areas that said no Indians allowed into the bars and stuff. So the, the discrimination was was like the South, only it was in the West for Indians. And um, 
him having grown up with Indian people knew that we loved our children and could take care of our children, regardless of how poor we were or what was happening. And um, he saw that firsthand growing up there. So I don't think it was any mistake at all that he ends up being because hmm. any other white person that would have heard that, well, he's not being white, but I mean, any other white senator from South Dakota hmm. hearing hmm. that hmm. would not have seen those mothers in the same way that he did because he knew us. Hmm. And those other individuals didn't. And then I think Bert Hirsch just being Jewish, you know, coming from that that standpoint would have a, an understanding of culture and understanding you know all that in that way but uh that that was a that was the hand of the creator mm. locked him there you know and uh so mm. yeah that, isn't that amazing it's yeah it amazing. is amazing you could tell I, in some ways i was struck in watching him uh, in Don land that the way he was asking questions, the wording of his questions yeah. was different than anything I would have expected from a congressperson. You um, mean they, yeah. Cause he goes, you mean they took, they had you sign your baby away before you was born. I yes. mean, just like, yeah. Putting that incredulousness yes. in it. Like, what are you kidding yeah. me? I know. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's why. And you're mm. right. The, that's you're, I'm glad you picked up on that because yeah, no one else would have cared. They would have looked at us the way everyone was looking at us at that time. White centered assumptions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, can I switch to like someone, uh, there's a, a question here that people really want to um, have asked. And so um, uh, about the community healing lessons from the, um, the Truth Commission here that are applicable to the Black Lives Matter movement. And then there's a, a later question, uh, some later questions about Black Lives Matter that maybe we could uh, touch on. I wonder, Sandy and Esther, um, if you have some, some thoughts about that. Um. <laughs> um, sure. Is it me? <laughs> well, either either one of you, oh. and Gail Warbeck's in the audience. You can, Gail, you could type some notes. <laughs> um, hi, Gail. <laughs> I think that um, you know the the whole goal of the Truth Commission, truth, healing, and change. Right? We have to, we have to start by acknowledging truth. And when we went through the when we went through that process, we saw in Donlin how how um, <clears throat> non-native people uh, particularly white people wanted to just kind of skip over the truth and, and just get to the reconciliation part and native people needed um you know because we've been our voices have been um <clears throat> squelched for so long we needed we needed to stay in the truth so i think you know it, it's playing out now too i mean it's the same dynamic folks are you know, I see folks say, oh, this is so tiring. You know, I've been saying Black Lives Matter for two weeks now and I'm tired. You know, <laughs> it's like, imagine, you know, being how sick and tired you'd be if you belong to the group who was being murdered with impunity, right? Yeah. Uh, so that truth and then healing and change and, and that it's not, it's not, you, could, you can't just click boxes. Um, you know, I, <clears throat> even as an indigenous person, you know, we've all been, we've been um, seeped in white supremacy and we can't, none of us can escape it and how that manifests itself is different with all of us, but we have to, uh, we have to acknowledge it and, and uh, heal from it and, and change it. Um, you know, it, there's a lot, I think there's a lot of parallels. <laughs> so Sandy, you have some some thoughts about that in terms of the Truth Commission, and well, I do. Be, you know, I had been doing truth healing reconciliation circles mm, seven years before I came to be a commissioner mm -hmm. in, in Maine. And what I learned in watching individuals who thought they know that knew the truth, never had heard <laughs> the truth. The thing that they had in common is that they weren't the same after they heard the truth. And I learned that most people in, especially in public service, and I'm saying most because we're always gonna find people who don't care, but for the most part, people that are in public service kinds of jobs, social services, um, 
probation officers, whatever, they're there because they have a desire to help. And so what I learned, even though I didn't want to believe this because I just thought all white people were asses. And, um, you know, that I went into this with that. I, that's the truth. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't have another experience. Right. Mm -hmm. So when I saw individuals respond to the truth, it was good that they cried. It was good that they felt things. The only thing that I would do to help them through that process is I'd say, well, don't feel guilty. You know, you, you, certainly you should be like, oh, my God, I had no idea this was going on. Now, what is it? Can you do? Even in your job on a daily basis, if no policies change, what can you do differently today based on what you heard? So even mm -hmm. those small things, because the majority of people want to do a really good job with what they've been given for the most part. The mm -hmm. majority of people, it's by design that they don't know what they don't know. Yeah. And once they understand, and, and the fear breaks down of meeting other races too, you know, because there's a lot of fear. I don't know, people are seem to be afraid of black people and brown people. And um, the so I believe that the truth does have to be discussed. And there's a man, uh, Richard Morrison from Canada, uh, an elder that I got to hear and listen for a few years in Minnesota. Um, Priscilla Day would have him come down and, and speak at our ICWA institutes. And I used to love it when he would say, the truth is the truth and can't be um, changed. It just is what it is. We do mm -hmm. not have to be afraid of the truth. You know, it's how we accept that truth and how we work with that truth that matters. And so, and I, so for instance, I remember this one social worker asking him about, he says, well, you know, I'm working with this mom who has a baby and the dad's not been part of the life. Now he wants to be part after all these years. So you could hear the judgment in her voice, right? And the frustration, mm -hmm. right? And he says, well, the truth is the truth and can't be changed. This is that child's father. And he just mm. paused, you know. Mm. So how do we help that relationship? You know, I just took it very calmly, you know, didn't have to like resolve everything at once. But um, so I've really come to believe like when we were, it just melded perfectly with the work that we've been doing all along, that it does change people. And until that happens, I don't know that I kind of feel bad when I hear these leaders talk about we're going to do police reform and I go, how are you going to do that? You haven't heard from anybody. <laughs> how are you going to how, what are you going to do? You haven't heard a damn thing. You're going to make it up in your head, which is what, you know, Drew pointed out. That's where it gets us in trouble. <laughs> yeah. And um, you need to work from your heart. He used to always say that's where all wisdom lies when we have that balance of the heart and the mind. So the, in terms of Black Lives Matter, one of the things um, I was really proud of the Minneapolis Indian community has been, they hit the streets immediately and we're walking with our, our African-American uh, brothers and sisters and, and uh, using the voice to uh, support them and encourage them and say, yeah. And uh, even though we are at a higher percentage of being abused by the police and arrested by the police than any other race. Mm -hmm. Mm. And, and when you hear the statistics on CNN, MSNBC, they'll say all these statistics and they won't even include Native Americans. That's and, right. yet, and yet we have the highest percentage of arrests and um, abuses. So, but we weren't out there screaming that. We were just out there going, we know brother, sister, you know, our, our people mm. were out there mm. uplifting that and say, cause it, uplifting one uplifts another. Yeah. It's not a competition. That's right. And so um, it could it could really help with some healing, you know, and healing doesn't happen overnight, doesn't have a timeline, takes a while. Yeah. I want to ask a question that sort of um, is connected with what you were just saying, that someone uh, in the questions asked my church's um, Peace and Social Action Committee has a decolonization task force. And so they're wondering, like, can like can we include the Black Lives Matter movement in the task force agenda there and not dishonor the work in support of Wabanaki people in Maine? So like that, you know, how do people understand um, about that? So Esther uh, or uh, Sandy, I wonder if you have some thoughts about that. 
Go ahead, Esther. What about you, Pen? Don't you? All know right. So yeah. Well, sure. But I was going to not start with me. But I, you know, to me, like I think with both pieces of those work as a white woman, both pieces of those work is like, what the hell do I have to learn? Like, what do I need to know? How do I need to? unlearn um, the white supremacy socialization that's in my brain and learn something so that I can hold both of those things as you were saying. And so um, so I think that there's a way to, to do that. And um, how do you keep asking your questions? What, what purpose am I serving here? And how are we um, not losing the whole but like responding to what the need is in this moment. You know, and, and it's even in uh, tank entwined with uh, supporting our LGBTQ folks and two spirit and trans people. It's all, these are all part of decolonization. You, yeah. you know, they're not, they're, they don't live in silos. They're all connected. Yeah, I think the decolonization lens really helps me because it it is like there's the foundation that we really have to get at for helping people to see in the way that it distorts our relationship with ourselves and one another and this place where we live um yeah all right um I just wanted to just drew somebody um, hasn't finished finished watching the film yet, and but you're going to announce. Aren't we going to have it available for folks that missed it till tomorrow, right? That's what we. Yeah. Um, if you go to the link, there's an expiration date on it. They should be able to see it. Okay, so I think uh, they. What, what you'll, dated? It's still. I think till tomorrow. Thursday or something. Folks. I thought I don't tomorrow, know. Tuesday, Tuesday. Yes, yeah. tomorrow. It's Tuesday, yeah. So Nancy, yeah. who wrote in the thing, you can watch it till tomorrow since you haven't finished. Yeah. yeah, just go back to the same link. Okay. Wonderful. Um Sandy, you wanted to talk some, and someone has this question. Or, um, how can community healing take place during this time of social distancing? And how has this time informed your approach? Um even going beyond this, beyond the social distancing time? Well, first off, I think we shouldn't call it social distancing. I think we should just call it physical distancing because we're still social. Right now we're being highly social. We're interacting, we're laughing. You know, people, Gail and George are, and my friend Ethleen, they're on here. So I'm connecting mm. to them. I mean, there's not, we are being social. We need physical distance. So yeah. that's, so if, I think when we, the words we use create that reality in our mind. So we have to keep saying physical distance, physical distance. All right. So um, secondly, we did a virtual screening for Red Lake Nation and they are doing some work there where they want to revamp how they do uh, social, how they do child welfare. They want to do a welcoming for their relatives. They want to do reconciliation in their within the tribe around child welfare. And we were all going, we had this all planned to go pre-COVID. And then COVID happens and we can't do anything. So um, my friend Priscilla and uh, Sherry Goodwin, the director, they just said, well, let's just do a virtual one. And at first I was like, oh, I don't know if this is gonna work, you know? And um, it's hard enough to get people to pay attention. They'll be not paying attention. They'll put their little camera on. They'll go all over. Who knows what's going to happen, right? And then um, there was about 50 people on the on the virtual screening. And um, what really surprised me is during the film, they're, re they're reacting, you know, making comments, you know. And I thought, oh, wow, that's cool. And then we put them into their little discussion groups after the film was over and the conversation went very deep even though we're um physically distanced you know from each other and i started thinking about it and we had some very emotional responses in um in blood memory and what i finally figured out was that everyone was in their safe space their home that is usually for the most part it's our safe space. So they were feeling all this st strong emotion watching this and yet still connected to people that they could type things to. 
And I started thinking about <clears throat> how people squirm, literally squirm physically when we're doing a truth and truth healing reconciliation forum it is exceptionally difficult for people to have all these feelings in front of each other. Um, mostly because white culture teaches you, you should not have emotions. You should be straight for, you know, no crying. You know, white people, I say, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, and that was one of the first things I learned being around Indian people is don't be, don't be sorry for your tears. Your tears are what's going to bring you your healing. And then tell, t give, you know, a whole teaching behind that. Well, anyway, what I, what I learned in this virtual experience is that in some ways, it people were more interactive because of the physical distance. They were safe in their own home, in their own spot, in their own home, and uh, plus they were in. They were willing participants too, even though it, you know it was their job. But they're you know they want something different. They're looking for something different, something to do that will bring about a change that they want to see in their workplace. So. I'm all down with the virtual now. I'm I'm like, yeah, let's do it, you know. And and if you have someone like Drew who knows how to do the admin part of everything, and you and if you have a good moderator to take care of the entering and the moving people around, and uh, it 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 does it works beautifully. So I'm I'm all right with it. So I'm thinking to myself, we have some screenings lined up in communities we're going to do all this work with them virtually when it's finally time that we can go get together physically we will have done all the hard work already and we're going to just hit the ground running you know once we see each other in person i'm i'm excited about that about this and maybe we'll go deeper in feelings because we will have already cre we've already experienced that initial shock mm -hmm. that initial purging of those feelings because it takes a while to, it takes a while to be able to share your story and, and where the emotions aren't as powerful or aren't as strong. And because uh, you've got to process that out and then over time. So I'm thinking this is a really awesome, I think there's gifts in this COVID stuff and this might be one of the gifts that we've been given. Yeah, also um, <clears throat> I have seen more, um, events where people can participate in prayer with each other and drumming with each other at like at the same time in your own home in your own space and and sometimes that's more accessible to some folks who might be shy about drumming in front of people or showing up yeah. you know but they'll be by themselves so that's been one way one positive thing that i've seen come out of it too that's really true i'm glad you brought that up esther because all nations indian church you know, Marlene, you met Marlene Drew. Um, she has a time every Wednesday we get together and we pray because from the since the outbreak of COVID and then the George Floyd and um, every week. And uh, I really come to look forward to it. And we wouldn't be doing it physically, if you know, but virtually we can. So. Drew, I have a question for you from uh, from someone who's watching this and wanted to okay. know how the films Blood Memory and Dawnland are related. Uh, do you have contact with the filmmakers of Dawnland? And um, they cover so many similar kinds of events and life experiences, yet they're really distinct. And so just your thoughts about uh, that. Your cousins, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> now we are. <laughs> no, I think it's been it's been a really good process. I um there was there wasn't any communication beforehand. Um I think it was because Sandy had been going up to Maine and she's like, Oh, I got to go to Maine again. I got to go to Maine again. And I was like, okay, what is going on in Maine? You know, <laughs> and like, I, was, I, was like, I, was just like, I was like, man, you're going to Maine a lot, Sandy. Like every time you're talking, she's like, I got to go to Maine. So I can't do that. Thing. And then I, and then she finally like told me about the TRC and everything. Oh, that's cool. And she's like, Oh yeah, they're making a documentary. And I was like, you do know we're making a documentary. <laughs> like, what's this documentary about? Like what's going on? What, you know? 
And um, and she's like, oh, don't worry, I'm not in it. <laughs> I was like, you're in it. <laughs> I didn't think I was going to be in it that yeah. much for reals. Well, the, I didn't think I was going to be in that. The first, time, the first time I talked to Adam too, I was like, I just, I was just, I called up Adam and I was like, hey, you know, um, you know, we're making a documentary about Sandy. I just want to know, like. What, like, what are you guys documenting? How is she involved? Just because, like, you know, I I had five years of my life shoved in, you know, financially invested and everything. And I was just like, what is going on? And uh, oh, he's like, oh, don't worry. She, you know, she's a, not a huge part. She's a good, a big part, but not like a huge part. I was like, okay. And then I saw the final cut and she's got like all the golden lines, you know. <laughs> like, out of the spotlight, you know? So. But no, uh, yeah, no. And, and ultimately, you know, we got to know each other through uh, the films being released and we haven't done any joint screenings yet. I think once we have completed our broadcast, cut, right now we're working to cut down the film to an hour um, oh, for wow. a broadcast, which wow. is a huge you know, Basically, yeah. the arc is gone and all the stuff with the law is gone. Unfortunately, it's really just about the story of Sandy's journey home and then the ceremony and how that conversation opens up for the community healing. So yeah. that's really the broadcast version of the film. And that I think would be, that would be an intense event watching. Oh, right, back to back. I right? do it all the time. Yeah. We do it all the time. I do it all the time. I'm do. I've done it several times. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's easy to do. It, because they, for who? I know. <laughs> She leaves the room when the movies start. So <laughs> yeah. I know. I go eat. I go eat. Yeah. Excuse me. I never watched Don Don Land either. Oh, real quick. <laughs> no, I do it all the time. I think it's just the best way to do it. I don't think you should watch one without the other, if possible, because one presents the intensity of the problem, the history of the problem at length, yeah. and the yeah. present day um, fight against the uh, ICWA. And, um, and then Don Land says, well, here's what you can do about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's why mm -hmm. I think, so by the time they get to Don Land, yeah, it's intense, but they've already experienced blood memory. They already kind of know yep. if they've, if this is all new to them, you know? Yep. And then that, that says that's a solution. So that's why I can't tell you how many times I've done the two of them together already. Wow. Oh, heck but yeah. In I fact, I had a three day, I had a three day conference planned with the two of them to highlight programs that are working now. Oh yeah, uh, decolon or decolonizing or deconstructing it. Oh yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Hey, Sandy, go ahead. Sorry. A lot of people have complimented about how they fit fit together. Yep. And that was something I was definitely concerned about. And then when I saw Dawnland, I was like, oh, this is a totally different film. This is a totally different film, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and then yeah. we just, you know, we just sort of stuck to what we intended and, and it just, you know, and it made sense. And uh, yeah. <clears throat> It, would be yeah. it, it I, was always, really, go ahead. I just gonna say it was really hilarious when, um, when I saw it first and I, and I have even the last line in the film almost mm. <laughs> 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 poor Drew. You know, like, I didn't have any, you know, we didn't, none of us had any, we had say, but we didn't have complete say over how everything went in the film. And I was like, Oh dear, poor Drew. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they are different, but I, I really like the way they intersect with each other um, yeah. because it, it's like it's like building a body of knowledge about what happened here uh, and the convergence of these things and the different things that need to happen. Truth, healing, and change. Right, all the whole the whole thing. Um, any well, any more that you want to say about the say film? One, yeah. yeah, one more thing just about the the filmmaking process too, with with uh, you know getting to know Adam and Tracy, and they're the only two I really know, and I haven't even met Adam in person. But um, one thing Sandy had said to me, you know, uh, early on, she was like, you know, it, it uh, this is your first film, and you just have to, you know, and like there's always going to be this is just a lesson to all filmmakers. Like I'm watching the films that are getting made right now, seeing what's getting funded, and a lot of them are the same story, you know, but the way our industry looks at stuff is it's like, I feel like sometimes too often they go like, Oh, we already took like uh, getting programmed at a film festival. They're like, Oh, we already did that film last year. So like a lot of uh. film festivals, if they don't really care, they see Dawnland was out. Cause Dawnland came out a year before us. 
they're like, oh, we already did that last year. We already touched that subject last year. And it's like, no, it's a totally different experience. Don't just look at it on the superficial, oh, it's an Indian, you know, story about adoption. You know, yeah. and so like I think a lot of it was having and the festivals that programmed our film, a lot of them did do Dawnland too, but they were the festivals I was most excited to be at because they knew what they were doing and there was intention behind their programming and not just like trying to have a native story, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, but also I would just say shout out to that crew because they um I learned a lot just by watching them. They're you know, having a year of being able to watch where they went and what they did and the way they were able to break down a lot of the walls with with that film and uh, reach such a broad community with the film um, has definitely helped us and helped me with taking this on for the first time, try and mm. figure out how to navigate it. So I will say that, so, you know. Mm. Yeah. Thank Tracy you, Lecter, the impact producer is, is wonderful, Tracy, oh, yeah. for mm. our outstander. Yeah. And and Drew, just to let you know, um, I beat up Adam a lot too, like how I used to. <laughs> yes, she did. When you, I did. Adam with one hand and Ben with the other. <laughs> I literally, I literally, when at, at one time Penn came back to tell me something that Adam was gonna do or not do, and I said what? He said what? <laughs> And she told me, and I went, I got up and I go marching in that room. I said, Hey, hey, get back here. And he like literally walked away from me, and I grabbed his shirt. And I said, you will not, care. whatever it was, I was scolding him about. But, um, and then. Uh, when and it the, worked. It did. <laughs> Got to go grandma on people sometimes, you know. It, it was his initiation into the Indian community, Drew. <laughs> and then, mm. and then, um, then when he, remember they showed us the, what they were going to make the final cut. I, oh my gosh, I had a visceral reaction. I got up and I walked around and I chewed their ears for probably three hours straight. But it's good that, you know, to, so to his credit too, he listened like, as you know, like, as you did, you know, and I kept telling him, I don't give a shit what your film school taught you. We're yeah. the experts of this story. We know what's, you know, <laughs> and um, look what Donland ended up being a beautiful, it just captured everything. When the second time they came out with that, oh, what gorgeous. I, I, yeah. I've was. always... I've always really wanted to find a venue for folks like Drew and Adam and Ben to share everything they learned about yes. white people filmmaking in indigenous communities because it's different than any, I'm sure it's different than anything else they've ever done. And those lessons I think need to be shared with, Maybe with that other white be, filmmakers. Thank Maybe you. that could be our next discussion panel yeah. thing. That we I do think here. that would be <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, Esther, because when I've been at film festivals where it's primarily non-native, I've shared that about don't go into our communities this way. And then I also think that it's important that um, like the way Drew's, uh, the way he was drawn into this story was not something he pursued as a white guy who wants to get, I know how to lift up these Indian people by telling this mm. poignant story, you know, no, it was far more than that. In fact, he didn't have a choice. I mean, if there could be a film about what he went through in making the film, mm. the, the, the mm. issues that he had to come to terms with the, um, how he had to shift, you know, from what he had been taught to what was happening in the community. And, um, so I, I always tell him, if any indigenous filmmaker wants to chew your ass out because you're a white guy telling an Indian story, you tell the hand of my card, tell him to call me and we'll have a discussion because this is not what his intent was, nor was mm -hmm. it Adam's. Adam did not come in. Adam and Ben didn't come in like saviors. They're like, hey, we will help you tell this story. We, this should be out here. And um, so th there's a difference between um, genuine wanting to contribute and help and trying to, and then also being um, seeing it as a taking advantage of and thinking that you're going to be famous because you told this Indian story. And I think that's a, a real important distinction to tell. I'm all about Indian filmmakers and, it, you know, as much mm -hmm. as possible, but it isn't always that way. It yeah. isn't. And it's we have to accept that. It's it's OK. It's good. So now we giggle the last one of the last times we traveled with Drew, we got to some place a day after he did. And there he was sitting with all these Indian grandmas in this room <laughs> talking about other stuff that was happening at that conference. 
And I thought, look at that. He's comfortable. They see him. He's respectful. I'm sure you took care of somebody and waited on somebody, right, Drew? Yeah. <laughs> and and um, could just be there. And yeah. we need our we need all of our relatives, not just not just our Indian people. We need everyone. Mm. So it was a very. I learned a lot too through the process in that area. Sandy, I want to circle back to the work that you're doing. Um, and we have a question for someone who said, um, you know, what help is available for late discovery adoptees whose white adoptive parents never told them that they were adoptive and native and that truth came out like right, like on deathbed um, kind of mm -hmm. scenario. So, um, you know, w tell us about your thoughts on that. Well, um, first off, you can contact me and I can, depending on where you're at, maybe I can even connect you to with some other native adoptees if there happen to be in that same area, first and foremost. there, There's a powwow here every November that you could travel to and meet other adoptees and experience that welcoming back to our circle. But I'd also say that um, I know that there is a lot of um, uh, there's shame for not knowing who you are, and there's fear of rejection, and there is um, also then just not having a language to describe what is going on internally. That's all normal, all normal. The shame doesn't belong to you. That that is not something that um, that's not something that you have to figure out and know immediately. But the feeling of that, that dissonance is something that um, can you can use that to per, compel you, to propel you. And so if you need to find out your records to see where you're at, you really can contact me. Um, I have a sample letter that can be sent to uh, the judge in the county that you were adopted if it's an um some of the states are closed adoptions and some are open and it all depends. But I have help across the country with this. And, and um, sometimes it's a fight to get records, to find out exactly where you're from, names of individuals. And sometimes it just, the doors just open. There, it, there just isn't a um, across the board uh, way to, the only thing that we can do consistently is the letter why we deserve to know who we are, please help us judge, because they ultimately are the ones that have to uh, give us our records. Um, what was I gonna say? The What really angers me, if there's anybody on here who by chance works in the adoption field, the thing that really irritates me about the adoption narrative and about the adoption policies is that when an adoption takes place, Typically, there isn't any ongoing support, which I mean is lifetime support, and there could and should be because adoption is a lifetime adjustment. When you have children, you finally have someone who genetically looks like you. And let me tell you, for any adoptee that has had a child knows what that feels like. It's freaky as hell, and it's awesome, and it's everything. It's scary, and, cry, and you cry, and it's all kinds of feelings. But... Um, the adoption world is not designed to for reunification. So don't, and they charge money. So like Catholic Social Services, Lutheran Social Services, and other adoption agencies often has a fee to search for you. Don't pay that. Don't go to them. Um, because mm -hmm. oftentimes they won't even have the identifying information you're looking for. And they're not equipped and don't know about historical trauma in adoption and native families. And if they did contact the mother or the father, may not know how best to talk that person, talk to that individual who we don't know what that birth mother or birth father was experiencing the day you were taken or the day you were relinquished. So, so much goes into that. So if you are wanting to, if you want help, my email is somewhere. You can just email me 
and uh, we can just go from there. So related to this, um, um, for uh, Native kids today who uh, there's a perception that they're in an unsafe situation, and this uh, very likely could be according to state agencies. Um, are they still um, uh, prey to adoption, and what can be done to avoid that? I, I mean, this, I, you know, I wonder if we can talk about the state of child welfare today, the things that are still going not great, and some of the changes that are happening. There is still uh, young mothers or any mothers who are in duress or it, the adoption industry really does prey on them yet today. It does. Um, there are places where you go in and you think you're just getting help and wanting to talk about your pregnancy. You're afraid. You don't know what to do, what to expect, you know. Um, and the next thing you know, it's being suggested that you give your child away for adoption because, you know, you don't have a job maybe that's going to pay you. You don't have a car, all these things that you don't have. And someone else could um, offer your child. They can offer that child the stability that every baby deserves and on the way they talk like that. So what is that saying? It shames the mother to think that she doesn't have that ability. She can't do that. And and uh, a while back, the Evan B. Donaldson organization has closed, but they were a research on adoption. And I heard firsthand uh, these generations of mothers who had um, whose children had been adopted out. And the one mother who was in her late 40s, that's the story she told. I went and I forget which organization she went to. She was in um, Anchorage, Alaska. And she said she was so terrified because she didn't have a car. How will I be able to take care of my baby? I can't in an emergency get to the hospital or whatever. So they, she said, before you know it, I'm picking up parents to give my baby to. And the long, the, the end of the story is she said when she had the baby she didn't she didn't want to give baby away but she was already down the road and they encouraged the mother they said well you know this family is waiting and they'll be disappointed that was what they freaking said to that mother that after she gave birth and so that was a coercion because there's money behind that adoption as well. And they might completely believe they're doing the best thing or whatever. But that mother, that woman said, you know, what I look back on that my fear was that I didn't have a car, that irrational fear. No one told me that was an irrational fear and that I could have figured it out. She said, and had someone helped me with that, I can tell you I'd be mothering my child today. So the, the industry has to exist. So they're going to have to coerce. There's still this narrative that a mother who is working at McDonald's can't raise her child. And granted, I'm not stupid. I know it's hard to raise a child in poverty. You know, I did it myself. I was raised in poverty and I, my children, the first half of their life was in poverty. That's not a reason to take a child and place them up for adoption, mm -hmm. period period, period, period. It's resources. So I'm not a fan of adoption because of the way it's handled. Even in an open adoption, the it always leans toward the adoptive parents' needs and emotions. It's not toward the mother. And we still have this narrative out that someone else can love your baby and give your baby more than you could give them. So, but Because somehow just your love is not enough. And if you recall in the hearing, in the opening of both of the films, that young mother says that uh, it'd be better off if my children were with a white family that can give them all the things I can't give them da, 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 and love them in a way that I can't love them. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, Sandy. Yeah. <clears throat> Is there anything you want to add around um, the child welfare systems, 
adoption? Um, just just that the the you know this fight for ICWA is not over, and it's really not about the welfare of Indian children. It's about it's an attempt to dismantle the existence of tribes altogether, and to if they can <clears throat> say through ICWA that it's a race based law, then then they can say um, we we're not sovereign nations, and they can do away with us. So it's really important to support um, ICWA. So when you're talking with your your representatives and like really like educating, educating, educating people about the value of ICWA, our elected officials need to know that because they've got to take that stand as well as um, so that's one one strategy for them. Yeah. Plus, ICWA is the gold standard in child welfare policy and practice. What do you mean by that, Esther? You want to say it's, something it's about that? It's best child welfare policy. Um, <clears throat> there's higher standards of evidence. <clears throat> there is um, active efforts, a higher higher level of practice and engagement with families. Um, <clears throat> they require a qualified ICWA expert witness. There's placement preferences. They um, recognize the tribe as a third parent child has a right to that tribe. Uh, imagine if every child had a right to a community. It's best practice mm. all the mm. way around. Mm. And yeah. it's, it's, it's founded in family preservation. Family mm. preservation. How many times do you hear that phrase? Family preservation. Mm -hmm. that, that means you know offering, what does mom need? Right now here in Minnesota, a mom can lose her child because she doesn't have an apartment. It's I, whenever I say that, I, I just think it's, I, I can't imagine a child coming back and meeting their mom when they're an adult and go, mom, tell me what happened. And she goes, well, I just got out of prison and I only had 18 months to get a job and I'd never had a job before. And I have this felony and all I could earn was, you know, $12 an hour, which wasn't enough to, fast enough to get. Can you imagine that? And that is happening today in the state of Minnesota. We have the highest rate of removal across the state across the nation, family preservation, family preservation. Yeah, there's something um, uh, painfully powerful going on in Minnesota right now. I mean, there, it is like the nexus of so much pain and violence um, against uh, uh, black and brown people, against um, uh, humanity. It really is um, quite devastating what, what is happening all around you in your community. Um, um, so we advertise this as we would go to, for 90 minutes. Um, I know we have, um, you know, we have a little bit of flexibility on time with that. Um, and, um, but want to move towards us thinking about like um, uh, closing. So I'm just going to see if I can get some um, uh, quick questions. Um, Drew, I, I'm curious, like, what's next for you and how, like, how does your experience on this, on this past 10 years um, impact where you go from here? Like, how what's the next last for you? 10 years shaped my life, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So just so you know, this thing will automatically stop recording at, at the two hour mark. So yeah, we're going to, we're going to yeah. wrap up hopefully will, yeah. in the next 10 or 15. Um, sure. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, I feel like I touched on it a little bit earlier, just sort of how it has impacted me as, as a person, as a man growing up in my twenties. Um, I, I still think right now, I think the biggest thing that I'm sort of grappling with outside of trying to get the film uh, done for broadcast and, and just right now, it's just a struggle to get it, it uh, to have it just sort of leave the nest. You know, it's like, I'm hopeful that pretty soon the film will, be a big boy and just big girl and just walk itself, you know, to college and I can, you know, <laughs> get a Harley and drive around a little bit. Um, but you know, uh, they moved back home though. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's where I'm at right now. So I get it. Like, Drew, I really get Drew, it. it's an Indian, it's an Indian child and Indian families are different. You know, this. <laughs> yep, I know it's, it's, it's been good, but like, I'm, but I'm learning, I'm just constantly learning. So I'm eating up every opportunity, like digging into the virtual world has been this whole new chapter. 
Well, every single thing I'm learning, and these are all small business skills. They're all entrepreneur skills. They're all creative personal skills. Um, I think uh, I learned a lot about the interpersonal relationships and how they can play out over time, you know, because when you're collaborating with somebody, even on in a short term window, there can be blow ups, there can be things. And when you try to collaborate with people over a 10 year period, mm-hmm. like it's amazing that Sandy and I still talk, you know, uh, when you really think about it. I mean, Mark and I don't talk because he's not very happy right now. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe he'll come around. Um, I have crew members that, you know, want, you know, the different levels of involvement, you know, at this point, but everybody gave what they could at a time that they could with the resources that we had. And yeah. we just, and so that is just sort of the thing that I think primarily will just, you know, guide everything going forward. Uh, but I think the biggest thing I'm grappling with, especially in our current climate is what's my next subject you know like i've had some ideas i definitely have some stuff that i'm called to that i really like um but the thing about this project was that it it came in and it didn't let go and every like i remember my my mom manages a, a thrift store and she she owned it and i remember one time i came back from visiting sandy and i opened this box to put books away at my mom's store and all the books at the top Somebody must have been studying like Indian studies and Indian law at the college nearby. A bunch of books that were on Sandy's reading list for me to read like six. Mm -hmm. And so it's like stuff like that, like the synchronicities, you know, the, the way that the creator was putting things there. Um, Mm -hmm. That's not Mm -hmm. happening yet with anything else, but I think it's still because I'm still in the midst of learning from this. Yeah. Yeah. So, but time will tell and who knows. Yeah, we'll see how the next coffee shop conversation happens when coffees open up again. So that's right. That's yeah. right. When, when you're open, things just sort of arrive, don't they? Yeah. Um, Sandy, um, I'm curious if you either have thoughts about like what you want to share about like what's next for you or something you want to leave with this group of people who've been listening to us tonight. Well, first, I want to just say thank you for to everyone who did come by and listen to, and listen tonight. Um, it was just feels really rewarding for all that that drew put into making this happen drew his crew megan uh whitmer also helping all the folks benedict all the people behind the scenes that whose faces we'll never see um quite amazing uh driven and carried through by drew and um it really warms my heart because I, I mean, seriously, because I saw this young man put everything he had into this, mm. everything. And he couldn't let go. It, it grabbed him and he couldn't let go and he just followed it. So um, the the to see individuals and groups come and want to learn and see what, what's in the film, just, oh, it, it feels good. And then um, I want to say, that you do need to look at your local uh, state legislatures and find out who supports the Indian Child Welfare Act. You really need to use your vote because right now we have issues with that, Um, trying to declare it unconstitutional, which is ridiculous. Um, And I have to brag for a moment. The California Indigenous Native American Film Festival uh awarded the film blood memory cultural the cultural impact award and when drew got it you could tell he was happy and and felt uncomfortable at the same time because being white right but yet this film has the cultural impact and i was just so proud of him and excited for him that he was recognized and then all these other awards along the way but um it came to pass that it did what he wanted it to do because of the impact that that initial story had on him the first time he heard it is what he wanted to convey. So what's next for me is I'm finishing my book. I started yeah. my, I start, you know, I started that and stopped, started, stop. And um, I'm actually doing that. And what really blew me away is Drew actually read it when I gave it to him. He's, he'd say, well, you said it in your book. And I'd be like, oh my God, I said that. Yeah, you're right. But, um, and then I want to just continue using blood memory and Donland to educate. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and to and to continue to encourage other communities to go through a reconciliation process mm -hmm. to um you know unearth that truth and use that truth to move them forward in a way that that's beneficial to families and communities hmm. someone wants to know what the title of your book is going to be sandy do you know that yet yeah it's um a child of the indian race generation after generation we are coming home mm. A child of the Indian race, because that's what's in my adoption papers. I tell, I explain all that in the, in the book. You're gonna have a, a chapter about that in Iqua and like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Esther, your closing thoughts for the evening, besides you're sleepy and hungry and. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that obvious, Pen? <laughs> you know, we go back. <laughs> um, no, I'm just, I'm so grateful that we were able to do this. I, I was thinking, I mean, the plan was we'd be just getting done with the Portland show on tonight, right? And then we were going to go to Portland yeah. and the state, and you were going to come to the studio and do a radio show. Um, but I'm going to put a plug in for the radio show because we recorded it last week with Sandy, yeah. Carol, and Gail. Maria Gerard and I, so it'll be aired um, Thursday night at four o'clock on WERU and check it out to hear some more uh, reminiscent. Wonderful program. Um, I want to say two things in closing. One is um, the little uh, green box, at least on my screen, underneath us all is a call to action uh, to support Wabanaki food security. Uh, it provides a link uh, that will push you to um, uh, the call to action page on the REACH website and talks uh, or identifies some different organizations that are supporting uh, Wabanaki food security. Um, uh, including REACH, but the food pantries in each of the communities uh, and uh, uh, Eastern Woodlands Rematriation Collective uh, as well. So wonderful organizations that are doing great things to make sure people have food on the table. And I just want to say, I feel like uh, physical distancing, I think that's the way to, to put it. I feel like I'm sitting in my living room talking with... Um, talking with friends and even the chat along the side uh, feels like warm little smiles going by as we're uh, sitting here having this conversation. But um, Drew, it's been a real um, a, a sweet thing to get to connect with you over these past few weeks planning for this. Um, and I think we got a bit of a glimpse of what uh, Sandy uh, has come to know in you. Um, and so really appreciate that. You created a, a beautiful film. And uh, Sandy, always, always love to be in the company of your heart and spirit. And uh, thank you for what you give to this world, my friend um, and Esther every day. So thanks to everybody for joining us this evening. Um, we're going to have a link to the recording of this webinar. Um, and I you can see, see the that. recording. You, Yeah, I think he, Drew's put it in the box a yeah. couple of times. We will probably post it on the REACH website and Facebook page as well. But you not only get, I mean, this is such a cool f uh, forum here. You not only get to see the chat, but you get to see the questions too, right? Drew, you were telling us how cool yeah. it is. To yeah, actually, let me see if I can find that real fast while you're, I'm not, I, I'm not going to. Yeah. Double tasking, multitasking. All right. Link. What he yeah. told us is that you, when you find the questions, the the list of questions, if you click on the question, it takes you to that part of the recording that where they answer the question. How cool is that? That's why we're here tonight, yeah, cool. checking out this Very this cool. cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this will be available um, for you to. Um, I, well, watch again if that's what you uh, would enjoy doing, but also to share with people that you think might be interested in this as well. Um, so we could put in a plug for the next the 23rd and the 25th we have two programs that reach is uh two live presentations of um five years later a look at um we main wabanaki reach and we're reflecting on the five years of the commission that's the 23rd and the 25th and you'll find that information on our events and both those uh, start at 6.30 uh, in the evening and uh, the 25th, there's tons of space available. So we'd love to see you there. So <clears throat> I just quick couple things. So I just put a link, it's the Vimeo link in the chat. That link is a tutorial for how all the functions in the recording will work. So if you click that link and just leave it open, um, it's a quick little video I made that shows you how 
to navigate this once the recording is available, which is about 15 minutes after we're done. Cool. Um, to view the recording, all you have to do is go to the same link you came to register. So it's just the link to this event. And instead of registering where it said, save my spot, it'll say, watch the replay. And it, ah. it's the same exact thing. Um, and yeah, and then the link to the film is still available. And once that does go dead, um, which I believe is in about 24 hours or so, you'll be able to email us and you can email me a message if you missed it or if you want to watch the last 20 minutes because you didn't get it. Or if you're trying to get it for your community, you can go to our website or just message us through there, um, through the Indie TV thing. But um, our website is bloodmemorydoc.com. That's uh, bloodmemorydoc. Um, and uh, should be uh, able to navigate it pretty easily to find what you're looking for there. And how long will this uh, recorded webinar stay up? It'll be available on this on this uh, profile uh, for as long as we have the profile. Right and on. Then, and then at some point, I'll download it and put it up on our uh, Vimeo page, uh, and you guys can have it, and it's super shareable. But the, that's great. The, what that tutorial is super helpful, especially for people who just want to have like a like they ask their question they want that answer you can export just that three minute answer and so it's super right cool. on yeah it's wonderful excellent next documentary film is going to be clips of this and and uh, <laughs> who knows what. so how many people were on this discussion i'm just curious we averaged around 120 to 130 to 150 ish the whole time Woo! we're at 90 right now so good, they good were, retention they were awesome, so guys. they were so <laughs> quiet <laughs> all right all right everyone have a good night thank you again uh for being Take here care. and uh, look forward to next time already yeah all right guys for thank you. Thanks for having it. bye bye-bye <laughs> uh -oh.